Well, it's a great goal. I mean, with Farmville, what, we hit a couple hundred million people? That's a good start. There's other people out there that are hitting 300 million people a month. So I, I think it's a good start. I don't know if, it, if, the, if the international environment is going to be able to settle on one thing, but maybe a couple of games could do it. Well, how, you know, is there, is there some magic ingredient that you put on a game? Is, it, is that oh. possible for all types of games or only very specific? Uh, you know, I don't know. I think it, it, every game has to have its own soul, and games appeal to different audiences, right? So if you if you had the if the world was one consumer, it might be possible. But when you look at all the demographics and all the different ages and all the different geolocations, that's going to be hard for one to do it all. <laughs> well, you know, more mobile games seem to be coming out with deeper strategic play. We we have, you know, we've been in an era where most of the games in the top. Uh, games were, were casual, and now we're seeing more and more games that are you know, more strategy. Uh, Empires and Allies, which right, we just right. did. Yeah. Um, you know, Clash of Clans, Game of War. Do you think that um, that trend is going to continue and deepen, or do you think that there's kind of a limit? Is, it, is depth of play antithetical to breadth of audience, or can they... Can they work together? You know, I think, I think there's a balance in that. Because if you look all back through history, there's always been strategy games. Go, chess, everything like that. Cards even, you know, way, way before there was any electronic games, there were strategy games. And one of the things you got to balance is the deeper you go on a strategy, the smaller the funnel is for your audience, right? And if you think about, well, like chess, everybody can play. It's easy to, easier to play but hard to master. Um, but when you get into something like a real-time strategy game and you're, you're, you're playing fast and furious with the controllers, that just means some people won't be able to play that or won't want to play that type of game. And so I think, you know, as you look through the ages of strategy games, they, they're on tabletops and then they went to computers and PCs and then there was a little bit of an evolution to, to console and now there's an evolution to mobile and each step along the way, they kind of took their own flavor, right? And, and so I, I think, I don't know if it's possible, but I think there's going to, I definitely think there's going to be more and more strategy games on like tablets. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we talked about uh, before when we were preparing for this about kind of the, the differences between the platforms and how oh, yeah. um, engagement, uh, you know, right now the thinking is that, well, mobile games are for when you're standing in line at Starbucks, you play for a few minutes. Okay. And console games, PC games, that's when you're, you know, for play hour, for hours. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but I, you know, I, I suggested, well, there's a, is there any technical reason why I couldn't have a game on my phone that could engage me for hours? Uh, you know, other than uh, input and control mechanism, if you think about, you know, you've got your, your device there, if it's a big screen and a tablet, you're going to sit down on your couch, you can play that for hours, right? Especially if you can project that device up to your big, big screen TV. Mm -hmm. um, but tech, you know, when you're typically when you're thinking about making a game for a mobile device or handheld device, you know that people will be using it in you know the Starbucks line or five minutes while they're waiting for a bus. So you want to narrow and allow for gameplay that can be in sh very short segments, right, in, in short sessions. But you could have something where there's parts of the game I can do in short oh, chunks, yeah, of and then course. Yeah, yeah. longer ones I can get involved Absolutely. for Absolutely. You know, uh, you can make three-minute battles that, that'll take up three minutes, but then if you want to relay out your base or change something up like that, that could take an hour. Yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly when you're talking about laying out or constructing your base, yeah. the more screen area you have and the more careful controls you have, the better it is, yeah, yeah. as yeah. opposed to a mobile platform where... Yeah, I think there's a balance between platform in play, right? When you have a very tiny mobile device, it's very difficult to get pinpoint precision that you can get on a mouse and a PC. And the same kind of with console, right? It's a little bit hard to use a controller. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, and that, that leads to very different types of games. Um, well, you know, one of the, the distinctions that we've talked a lot about mobile games and free to play, and, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration with free to play games out there, the people, uh, especially hardcore gamers on PCs. I, yeah. I hear this from my son all the time. No, I don't want to play mobile games because they're, they're squeezing me. They're, you know, they're demanding that I put money in to play. I'm used to Command and Conquer where I can keep going as long as I want. Yeah, you pay and once for the pay, disc or whatever, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then here I, you know, I'm being asked, well, I can speed things up, otherwise I have to wait a day for the space to appear. And it's, it, you know, it's a different mindset. Yeah. Is, 
do you think, but, and yet there's, there's free to play games like League of Legends or World of Tanks where you know, their conversion rate is much higher than a typical mobile game. And from what I hear of the fans, they're happy to pay for the stuff they get there. Is, you know, can we see mobile games where people are similarly happy to I, pay I for things? I think so. I think if a player's ever feeling like they're squeezed or the company is standing there with their hand out for more money all the time, maybe the game design needs to change, right? Because I look at it from the point of view of, I want to give players a great fun experience. And one of the things that detracts from that is if they feel like I'm always just begging them for money. And so the, the trick from the game design point of view is how do you change that up? How do you make people say, I love this game and I'll spend a little bit extra, like League of Legends and things like that, to get a little more fun or get a little variation or to personalize it for myself? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a good balance. But you know, in the West, we're still learning a lot of things. Like we heard people on the stage talking about how they've been doing this in Asia since the late 2000s. It's just the learning curve we're gonna go through. Well. Um I mean, one of the other things we talked about and, and that you alluded to just now is, is it's about game design, but the marketing of the game and how you talk about oh, the yeah, game, yeah. and then the data science that goes into it and how you adjust the game in response to what people do. Yeah. Those things, I, I think they, they really kind of work together, don't there's they? A, there's a strong symbiosis between, okay, as a game maker, you make the game and you want people to play it, but you have to use data science and metrics to make sure you understand what people are doing, what they like, what's working from a game design point of view. But then for the marketing side of things, you have to integrate how do you find and bring the right type of players into your game. And, and what I've seen you know, right now, I believe, player acquisition is just as important as PMing was five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Right now, PMing and having great PMs and great data analysis and analytics in your app and, and tracking all your metrics, that's just kind of table stakes. <laughs> the next step is how do you find the right players in the most efficient way? And, and also keep them around for a oh, long of time, course. too, because yeah. one of the problems that a lot of games have is that the beginning game, whether it's World of Warcraft or you know, mobile games where the, the grind or I, I'm going up to max level, that's one game, and then the end game is entirely different. Right, or right. just this game is really fun in this time period after I've gotten to a certain level, but, but after this other level, then ah, it's kind of boring. I keep doing the same thing. It's uh, a, how do you do When I look that? at that, I, I think about it as an, a, a, a long play entertainment experience. Sometimes I call it like the social director on a cruise. You come in in the first part of the game, you're having fun doing one thing, but after you get used to that, the game has to evolve to give you more fun for the different phase of player. You're a different player after you've been playing for a month or two months, right? So give, give fun for that. And then the third phase is, you know, a continuing long-term play. When I think of that, you know, Mafia Wars uh, had three different phases on it. First was a click mission phase, and then it was a real estate game phase, and you felt like a mogul by getting millions of dollars in, in real estate, and then it became a PvP game. Those are distinct phases that the game went through, and people loved it. Yeah, and it's, but I, I probably some people liked one phase, but maybe not another yeah, phase. Yeah, of course. Over time, the audience narrows down. You have the long-term retainers that stay there for a long time. But part of the job of a game maker is to keep introducing the fun that those players like all through the phases. You know? I mean, that, that's another aspect where a lot of games, you know, have regular content, introductions, oh, new yeah. content, yeah. live events, and other things. But at a certain point, that can be problematic to the design. I mean. League of Legends, how many champions could you realistically have and maintain any kind of balance? Yeah, and, and entertainment's each one consumable, you have, right? You know, so that, that fit, it just think, I like to put it in terms of, a, of a, a TV show, you know, episodic TV show. When you see the first 10 episodes, you have one experience. By the 500th episode, <laughs> it's not gonna feel the same, right? So yeah. you gotta keep changing and mixing it up. Yeah, and, it's, and maintaining over time, yeah. it's, it's very difficult to, to get to 100 episodes and to get to 200 episodes is another whole. It's a, it's a craft. It's a, it's a craft and a science. Haven't yeah. we seen that episode before? Yeah. You know, that yeah. was. Um, well, another uh, another thing I wanted to ask about is, and I don't think this gets enough discussion. And people say, yes, Minecraft has been an enormous success, and right. and, and yet I don't hear people talking about what lessons it delivers. The fact that it's sold over 20 million copies for mobile at 599. I know that's incredible. Is, nobody else has done anything. And that like doesn't that. even count the PC sales. Yeah, that's right. another 30 right. million copies. Right, right. Uh, I think it's over 50 million combined. Um, that's one aspect to it uh, that says, at least, at, at least in one case, it's possible to have a premium price game and to do extraordinarily well with it. Right. Is that just 
I'm sorry, that's a complete fluke. Nothing will ever do that again. Or is there some Don't, They seem like they come around that? once a generation or a couple of times a generation, right? Don't they? They're, it's a game that just kind of captures a, uh, the imagination of an age group or so. I, I know, you know, last Wednesday I was at a, a, a gaming league event with my daughter and everybody was playing Minecraft, competitive Minecraft, which I didn't think was possible, right? But it was awesome. And I think that the game itself captured that generation's imagination. It's sort of like live Legos mm -hmm. and build and craft and it could be their own world. Not too difficult, could run on any machine known to man. I think that's what happened with it. Do you think that, I mean, the other aspect of Minecraft I found extraordinary is it completely broke with the general wisdom of, well, games have to be really pretty. Oh, right. You know, the right. first time anyone ever saw Minecraft, it's like, that's ugly. It hasn't then, changed a lot, has it? Right? No, no, but then yeah. very quickly it was, this is so cool. And no, that, yeah. that's the way it looks. That's the aesthetic, and I like it. You know, it's a I, great game. I think it won because of the simplicity and the approachability on the surface, and then just the, the compulsion of digging and finding surprises. <laughs> it's like an infinite scratch lotto ticket, right? But, but I mean, some companies uh, on mobile as well have said, well, we're in this... Yeah, it's a, getting more competitive, it's extremely competitive, yeah. and one of the ways we compete is we gotta make our pictures prettier than everybody else's. And that's a lot more money and more time, and, and I wonder, when you have a, a little screen this big, oh, I know. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. don't you reach a, a point where extra months and, and millions into graphics don't really get you very much? Uh, you know, I think so. Um, and it's just a matter of where that trade-off's gonna be. As screens get more and more high resolution, and it also ma it matters per age group right? Mm -hmm. Younger eyes, more capable of seeing than older eyes. So um, yeah, I think there's definitely a point of diminishing returns on that. I don't know if the industry's found it yet. I mean, if you can look at the top 10 chart, you find out simpler graphics, happier graphics tend to work better for some games. I, I think, you know, the, it's as old as it now seems to all of us in this room, mobile's still a very young piece of the game business. So, um, I mean, do you think we can start to see some changes in the top grossing titles in mobile. It's been pretty static for years. It's yeah, I think, I think so. You know, just like you see changes in large companies around the world, you know, for, at one point, everybody thought Lotus was the king, and then Microsoft was the king, <laughs> and Apple is the king, and Google's the king. It, it just keeps changing up. I think the same thing happens with games. Again, because entertainment's consumable. Eventually, the, the third year someone plays a game, it's not gonna be the same, and they'll be looking for something new. And maybe it's new graphics, maybe it's new content, new theme new gameplay style. Also, in some cases, uh, the companies at the top take their eye off the ball and get well, feeling complacent well, about right, their position. Right. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you see that happen all the time. The people who are making that game get bored of it. Yeah. Or they run out of creative juice, you know, and that's the time you bring in some new talent to help keep going. Again, like a TV show, right? Yeah. And, and you hope to have your next hit already underway before oh, yeah. the first one Right, right, that's the curse, off. right? You get one <laughs> giant hit, you gotta make another one, right? Yeah, that's, uh, speaking of which, let's talk about Farmville for a minute. Sure. Um, having just come out of, of Zynga, you know, uh, Farmville was an enormous right. success. Yeah. Billion dollar property, uh, huge numbers of people, hundreds of millions of players. What, you know, what lessons do you think Farmville should hold for other companies and looking to design games oh. that can achieve a huge level of success. You know, I think Farmville was a lot about timing, and it was right, a lot about the audience, and so if I had to point to anything from that is know the audience and you know, do your best to take advantage of, of waves, like the growth of Facebook or the transition of what I call the, the, the mother, the mom network, right, to start transitioning from email into Facebook where they connected with their friends and family, and that really helped it. But on the game side, simplicity, having something compelling and fun to play that doesn't take a long time and you know, just has, has kind of that, that depth that you talked about a little bit in Minecraft where it's kind, of, you know, it's kind of tricky. You get into it and you start having fun and pretty soon you're like, wow, this is a lot more fun than I imagined. It's very approachable. Easy to start and hard to leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, once you've built your farm up a little bit, oh, well, if I just planted another Right, you area care about there. it, something that you care and connect with. You know, we called it Invest and Express. It's your little, your little place on the web at the time. Right? Well, you know, and, and then uh, talking about contrast for you, uh, Empires and Allies, which you did. Right. Was, uh, you know, not very much like Farmville kind at of, all. Yeah, kind <laughs> of opposite. What an opposite audience, right? It's yeah. male. What did, what did you learn from Empires and Allies and how it was received and... Were there any surprises after you went live with it that oh, things you didn't gosh, expect? Let's see. Um, 
We knew we were going after a completely different audience, right? We we're going after male audience. Farmville was mostly a female audience, the same as Cityville was mostly female. And I guess surprises is how, how people were just waiting for a game like that, right? And the amount of engagement that everybody played. And then, you know, uh, not surprising, but expected as more and more social features got layered in there, like leagues and alliance versus alliance. Um, you know, that just raised the engagement even more. And that, that's really fun to see. As people really want to uh, to have a social social competition, experience. yeah, yeah, definitely, e either cooperative or competitive. Yep. I guess. yep. Um, well, here's a you know, let's. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, Farmville as an esport, but we have seen <laughs> right. we have seen a huge explosion of the number of people of people watching other people play games, right? And the growth of esports and and so forth. Does that what implications does that have for the future of games? Are there implications beyond just make your game an eSport if you can? Does it imply anything about what people get out of games or what they expect out of it, games these days? You know, I think um, the first time that I saw games as an eSport were way back when I was making Red Alert 2. We went to Korea and we saw everybody playing um, in, in internet cafes and they were all playing StarCraft competitively. There's a television channel. And this was what, uh, year 2000 or so, yeah. right? And what I got to see then was a very first look at this is, this is the new generation of sports. You know, I was talking about my daughter. We went to a Minecraft competition. She was playing it. And I commented to my wife. I said, you know what? I played baseball and football and stuff when I was growing up. Now our kids are doing eSports, right? And yeah. it's just a generational shift. So yes, I think uh, you know, watching someone compete in League of Legends can be as exciting as, as people watching NFL games. Well. Um Okay, but uh, let, let me ask one, one more thing. What's, I mean, you, we've talked a lot, you've heard a lot of people talking about VR and, and mixed reality and yeah. esports and other things. What's the most exciting area in the future of games for you? What, what gets wow. you excited yeah. about games in the next few years? A lot of stuff. So first, I think we're very early on in mobile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you look at that and the social nature of that, that's exciting when you look at VR. And I, I'm thinking AR more than VR. I mean, I, I, the analogy of you block yourself away in this VR uh, you know, room inside your head or inside the goggles is cool. But when I think about the, the social nature of AR where I can see you and I can see the game experience happening, I think that's really cool as well. And you know, I also think bringing the international monetization, the monetization that happens that, that company, uh, companies in Korea and China have known for years, and bringing that to the US, I think there's some great lessons. That's, that's stuff, I'm, I'm in learning mode right now. <laughs> Go out, check out the world, find out what's cool, and then figure out what to do. Well, you know, in some, some cases, it does seem like the game markets in China, Korea, Japan, US, they're very different, cultural, oh, really big different. cultural differences. Yeah. And there's really not that many games that, that connect them or cross right. over. Do you think that that will change? Do you think we might see more games that cross you, those cultural? I don't know if the games are going to cross as much because if you look at console, there was, there's you know Asian console, Japanese console games, and a lot of them don't work in the U.S. and vice versa. But I think there's lessons that could be transferred back and forth. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the idea that there's people who've been doing free-to-play games for 10 or 15 years already. I think there's something to be learned out of that and bring it to the U.S. and vice versa. There's a lot of stuff that we do in the U.S. that's it's kind of new and unique to our market. Well, um, one last thing then, you know, we've talked a lot about things that people could think about doing. Yeah. What's, what's the greatest danger that's in front of game companies as they construct new games and try to go into these markets? What should they be looking to avoid or overcome? I, I think one of the greatest dangers is the, uh, that sort of speculative dreaming of if we just make something, then, you know, the audience will be there, or we'll, we'll make money. Right now, it's very competitive. Right now, the idea of trying to get players to play your game with thousands of games in the App Store, it's a top 10 business, right? So with thousands of games, there's going to be 10 of them that do really well and 900 that don't for every thousand games you have, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's tricky. And, and my, my take is you got to balance the business and the game. You can't just do one or the other. All right, well, I think that wraps it up for us. And thank you, Mark. Right. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much to Mark and Steve. Um, we're now going into our afternoon break, so we need to be back here promptly at 4 o'clock. 
um, where we will be welcoming on stage Keith Bosky and Emily Greer. Uh, so be back for that. Uh, for now, please enjoy an afternoon break, half an hour, and we'll see you back here at 4 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>